questions, um, but I'm going to focus on trademarks because uh, the idea of this seminar, uh, what we want to talk about today that's kind of different from the other seminars we've done in the past is, okay, you are a cannabis business. What are some of the things you want to start thinking about? And since all of you sell something, uh, we need to start thinking about how are you selling that product and how can you as a business protect yourself as you develop your reputation for the products or services you sell. So a trademark is basically the legal concept of what your brand is. The mark itself is something you're using to identify it. Um, if you think about a famous brand like Apple, it would be the Apple image on the back. It would be the name of that company. Uh, it would be the ID, it would be the name, the slogan, the logo you're using to help your consumers identify you in the marketplace. I'm going to use a couple definitions here real quick and then we're going to run through trademarks so that we all know what I'm talking about when I say different words. A trademark is historically for goods, physical products. A service mark is historically for services. In the world of trademark law, we basically use the word trademark for everything, and that's what I'm going to be doing because no one uses the word service mark. But basically, you are an owner of a trademark, and what you'll be doing if you have a trademark is trying to stop other people from using it to your detriment. It's what helps Coca-Cola, the soft drink company, stop some other soft drink company from selling Coca-Cola products, right? If they have a cola, and they want to call it Coke, the Coca-Cola company uses a legal protection called the trademark right to stop them from doing so. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we look into the cannabis industry here. So historically, there are three ways to develop trademark protection. And I'm going a little quickly through just what a trademark is. And I see a lot of people taking pictures of slides. I do believe we're going to make the slides available to everyone. So feel free to do that. Um, and if anyone has questions along the way, raise your hands. I'll take questions too. So, you protect and establish a trademark by using it. So once you have a trademark, there are different ways you can register the protection for that mark. One would be with the state that you're operating in, and then you can nationally protect that mark through a federal registration. So before we talk about registering something, let's talk about how you get a trademark in the first place. Trademarks are created through use. First, you identify what you're selling, the product or service. You identify the mark you're associating with that product or service and then you prove that you're actually using that mark in connection to the product or service when you're selling it to your consumer. Once you have done that, you have a trademark. It's as simple as that. We refer to that type of trademark as a common law trademark. You don't need to register or file anything. You just need to start selling a product or a service in connection to some sort of mark to identify to your consumers what you are and what your product is, and now you have a trademark. When you just use your mark in connection to your sales, you do start creating rights. The problem with common law trademark rights is they are very, very limited in scope. They are limited specifically to the geographic areas you're providing these services, uh, and your ability to prove that you have this protection falls down 100% onto your ability to prove it. Trademark rights are going to be based on a lot of certain things. It's going to be based on, well, who used it first, who was using it where. And if you don't have evidence to support your claim that you were using it first and you were using it in Michigan, you might be right, but you're not going to be able to win in a dispute. So when we're defending ourselves, and that's really what trademark law does, it helps you either stop someone from using a mark to your detriment or defend yourself when someone's claiming you're using a mark to their detriment. So a common law right can get you there. So if you've never filed anything, if you've never registered your marks, but you have evidence to support why you're using that mark, when you were using them, how you were using that mark, you can do so. But it's difficult. So most businesses are going to, when they develop brands that are important to their company, take steps to effectively formalize that protection. So, and I'll talk about the difference between these two steps. In most industries, we do federal trademark registration. And I'll talk about that, what that is in a second. For cannabis specifically, I would skip this. If we weren't talking about cannabis, I'd go right to federal trademark registration because no one does state trademark registrations. But so that you know why, I'm going to tell you what it is. You can take your mark, register it with the state of Michigan, and then you have some legal protection in our state for the products or services you sell in connection to that brand. I'll let you read for a second here before I move on. But basically, it's a way for you to prove certain factors, such as when you first started using the mark. 
So instead of just claiming in a courtroom, well, I was using this mark since March 2016, you can point to, I registered this mark with, this, with the state of Michigan, and here's the registration that I filed it to prove as evidence of what you were doing. It's a lot more sustainable in a dispute with a competitor. So the problem with state trademark registration is you need to actually be in the marketplace. So if you are currently thinking you want to be a cannabis business, but you are not open and operating right this second, and you have a tr cannabis brand, well, great. You hope to have a trademark in the future, but you are not using your potential mark in connection to the product or service you're selling today. You have the intent to do so in the future. So you'd not be able to actually establish a state trademark registration because you're not open and operating, right? The other real issue is we're in the state of Michigan. Cannabis is intrastate at the moment, so it doesn't impact us as much, but if you do establish a trademark protection at the state level, it's only good for the state of Michigan. So if you were the Coca-Cola company and you only had a Michigan trademark registration, you would not be able to use the protection that registration creates in other states, which makes sense when you think about the level of protection we're talking about here. So that is why every industry, ours included, wants a federal trademark registration. This is the highest level of protection. I'll talk about what that protection does in a moment. You register your mark with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, what I'll be calling the USPTO. And what that does is it gives you the right to effectively establish your brand protection in all US states and territories. And it does another very important thing for new starting businesses. It allows you to file what's called an intent to use trademark registration. You cannot get a full registration for your mark until your mark is in use. And what that means is you're selling whatever you're claiming your product or service is. But you can start your trademark registration protection by knowing you intend to use that mark. What that allows you to do is not have a warehouse full of products with your logo all over it, see if you're going to get that registration, and be into a point where you know it's very likely that registration is going to stick before you actually go put it on all of your products and services and try to sell them. So at the state level, if you hope to have a brand and you're going to file a registration and you know you need to actually sell those products, and then you find out that that brand that you want to use is either unavailable or is going to create problems with other businesses, well, in order to get to the registration at the state level, you have to have sold it, which means you have to have products or services likely branded with the mark you want to use, and you find yourself in a situation where that brand has problems, well, now you have to either relabel everything, remarket yourself, et cetera. Intent to use is where most new businesses or new market are going to test ideas. You can say, I want to sell soap with this brand. I don't have any soap. I just want to do that. So I file a registration, it goes through, and if other soap companies think that that brand's too similar, we will you know, know that before we have a warehouse full of soap. Yes, ma'am. Well, kind of, and that's really the whole point of this conversation, so you'll see where we're getting with this, right? So it is federal registration, and obviously cannabis is not currently federally legal. So um, let me talk about, a little bit about what the benefits are. I'll get back to your question, because obviously that's what we're getting to. So the benefit of a full trademark registration at the federal level is you have a legal presumption, several legal presumptions. You are presumed to be the owner of that mark. You are presumed to be the exclusive owner of that mark, and you are presumed to be the first user of that mark. Um, another famous legal presumption is you are innocent until proven guilty when you are charged with a crime. What that means practically is the burden of proof, the person who has to pay the money to prove that you are doing something wrong, is the person challenging you. So if I hold a federal trademark registration and Barton represented a company that thinks I shouldn't be allowed to use it, they have to file the lawsuit, they have to pull up a bunch of evidence to show that they were using it first or they were using it in a way that I wasn't supposed to, and if they can establish that in the courtroom to a certain degree, you know, beyond a clear and concise, you know, set of evidence that they were in fact correct, then I would have to come back to the courtroom and show my evidence. So it puts the cost of trademark enforcement on the party that doesn't hold the registration. And that's going to be huge in a business world where it's very easy if you just hold a common law right for someone with more money than you to use the court system or use trademark infringement you know, steps to say, I was using it first, because you come into the courtroom as equals. Whose evidence is better? You might be actually right, but they might have better evidence given the facts and circumstances. So holding both the state trademark registration and the federal trademark registration just makes your company have protection when we're talking about your brand. It is not unlike having insurance on this asset. 
it makes it much easier for you to build that brand because you know there's this layer of protection surrounding it. It has a couple other useful tools for most industries. Some of these might not be immediately available to cannabis yet. Uh, for example, you can, if you are a physical product trademark, you can file that trademark registration with the Customs and Border Patrol. Uh, that will help you stop counterfeit products from coming into our country. Uh, cannabis, obviously, is a few years away from taking advantage of something like that. But if you're providing services and products related to the cannabis industry that might be federally legal, such as bringing in lighting equipment, uh, other you know, cultivation processing, testing equipment, uh, that equipment is likely to be federally legal. And you can use trademark registration to help with Custom and Border Patrol if you're worried about, not to pick on the country, but like counterfeit products coming in from like Asian markets and things like that. So a lot of the useful things. If you're uh, the type of company that's selling products through a service such as Amazon, you can also privately register your trademark registrations with a lot of those bigger companies, and that will help keep counterfeit products out of those systems. So if you hold a federal trademark registration and you're selling products on Amazon and you filed that with Amazon, Amazon has a system that will help protect you where you won't even see it working, where they keep products that they know aren't associated with your account that has the registration. Uh, there's a lot of services out there. One of the most important things it does for us is, well, a couple things. It, it is a line in the sand. It's a flag. When your trademark is registered in the federal database, it is searchable. When you are determining, hey, I have this brand idea for this product, one of the first things your business should be doing is seeing if someone else is already using that idea. And one of the best places to look first would be the United States Patent and Trademark Office's trademark database. If you want to sell a t-shirt with a check mark as your logo and you're living in, you know, in, you're, you're oblivious, you know, you would be able to see, okay, here's the image description of my logo. It is a stylized version of a check mark. I want to use this with apparel. And you will see that the Nike Corporation has thousands of trademark registrations for variations of their famous logo. Same thing's going to happen in your industry, whether you are cannabis or t-shirt apparel, smokers articles, uh, security services, legal services. When you know what your products or services are and you have a brand idea that you're starting out for the first time, um, if some other company out there is using something that's similar to it and you try to just start using it because you didn't put the legwork in to check, those companies can stop you from using those brands. And in some cases, if they can prove that you directed clients that were trying to hire them or trying to buy their products to your services because your market was too similar to theirs, they can sometimes come after the profit that you made as well. So if you're going to be starting any type of business and you're going to be calling that business any type of word or using a logo of any kind, you should see what other businesses providing similar services are doing and move yourself away from using a mark that's basically already being used. So, and what that's called from a legal perspective is likelihood of confusion. This is the test we use in a trademark dispute. If two marks look too similar and they are used in a related marketplace, then the one that has the established protection, either being used first or registered, uh, is going to be able to prevent the other mark from existing if those two marks are related in the minds of a consumer. So if I'm an apparel company with a checkmark logo, it's obviously going to potentially be similar to Nike's famous swoosh, right? Because they look the same. That same concept is going to apply for other similarities. If I want to call a computer company apples with an S, well, those words are about the same. The sound is about the same. It obviously has the same meaning. Uh, and it's likely to confuse a consumer. If I want to call my computer company Pear, um, then we probably could do that. Obviously, we're doing a similar commercial impression. Um, and the Apple company might not want to compete against another fruit-based uh, computer and phone provider. Um, and they would have to prove that that's a strong enough commercial impression because they can't rely on the word appearance and sound to be the same. Now, that doesn't mean that it's impossible for them to not create a commercial impression or a deception uh, with a mark, an image, or a slogan that you're using, but it obviously makes that a harder dispute for a company like that to win. Um, when you think someone out there is using something that's going to confuse your consumers or the people who are purchasing your products and services, the context that we are going to be evaluating that potential dispute in is this one here. I'm selling marijuana. They're selling marijuana. Here's the mark we're using to do that. Are they related in the minds of our consumer? And that is how we do the test. All right. So trademark rights, 
grow in territory based on which registration type you're using. Common law is actual geographic use. If you are a company in the city of Detroit, and that is the only place your products and services are available, and you have not registered your mark, then your protection likely does not extend much further than your actual market. If someone in Kalamazoo is using a similar mark to identify their products and services, neither company is registered, um, it doesn't matter who used it first in a lot of cases, you are only using it in Detroit, they are using it on the west side of the state, it's unlikely that either company would be able to prevent the other until other factors exist. Now, other factors can exist, but the problem there is we only have a common law right, so we only have evidence based on who was using it first and where they were using it, and our actual evidence is I've only been in Detroit, which means it's gonna be difficult for my company with those facts to stop someone outside of my market from using a similar mark, right? State registration is a little more obvious. It only extends to the borders of Michigan. Federal registration has its limitation as well. It's countrywide. You can't march into Canada, Mexico, Europe, Asia with just a trademark registered in the United States of America because that protection is from the United States, not from the country of Canada, not from the country of Mexico, et cetera. So there are trademark registrations you can get in other countries but each market you're entering into has its own set of laws, similar to how each state you're entering into has its own set of laws. So, how do we enforce a trademark? I, I hope that the idea of a trademark dispute is, is fairly apparent. Two companies use a mark that confuses consumers. What does the company with the stronger claim do, right? So, the most common first step is to communicate business to business. And, and the, the more aggressive form of doing that is to send the other company a cease and desist letter. You're putting that company on notice that we believe that there is a claim of infringement and we will take additional steps to do something about it if they continue to create confusion for our marketplace. If that infringement's clear, you identify it. Uh, however, the infringement might, might not be clear. So if there's a disagreement uh, you know, and communication, just business to business isn't working out, then we enter into the legal system where we have a lawsuit and that is where legal presumptions really start making a play. If I'm going after someone who holds a federal trademark registration or a state trademark registration and I don't have it, now I really hope my evidence is strong because I have to rely only on the evidence I have. I can't really force them to help me win when they hold the registration. The burden is upon me. And in most cases, the reality means which company has more money, right? So if you're a company that's potentially going to have a dispute with a more financed company, a company like Nike, who has millions of dollars to throw at their IP enforcement, um, then you really hope that your evidence is strong. The reason you would want to hold a registration for a mark that you think a company that's going to be interested in using that is going to come after you for is because your registration is going to put the burden on them, where they're going to have to spend their budget on getting past that court barrier to actually prove that you were doing something wrong. And in the case where you actually weren't doing anything wrong, the legal system isn't gonna support them. Now, I'm gonna move past this a little bit. It's not foolproof, right? The actual right to your trademark is through use. Were you using it first? Where were you using it? What types of products or services were you using it for? Filing a registration is like filing an insurance policy. It helps you immensely. It will save you a lot of money and grief and time but it's not going to be 100% foolproof. If they can prove they were using it first or they were using it in the marketplace that you weren't in, they can still win regardless of registration. So keep that in mind. It's very, very useful, but it's not perfect. All right? So, let's see here. Uh, like I said, it's evidence-based. Uh, presumptions exist. So I'm gonna move past these. So, all right. I needed to lay the groundwork for just what trademarks are so that we could talk about marijuana trademarks and get to a question such as yours. All right, so cannabis and federal registration. Cannabis is federally illegal. Federal trademark registration is a federal protection. If you are immediately involved in the use of a controlled substance, then federal trademark availability is not for you. That does not mean there's not marijuana trademarks. What that means is you cannot file a protection for something that's illegal. You are asking for a protection from the federal government for a substance that is illegal. So why are we talking about marijuana trademarks? Doesn't that just mean we can only use common law and state trademarks? Not necessarily. Specifically, you cannot file for protection for something that is illegal. But no matter what your business is, even if you are primarily a cannabis business, that does not mean that is your only product and service. And we're gonna talk about how cannabis companies are using 
registration to build and support the brand. So, obviously, for cannabis, state registration is very important because in Michigan, these businesses are legal, so we can get a state registration for our brand. Um, I really can't even think of another industry that uses state trademark registration the way the cannabis industry does because a federal trademark registration is going to preempt a state trademark. How can a federal trademark registration um, protect you countrywide if it doesn't do anything against the Oregon registration, right? Or it doesn't do something against the Utah registration. When you have a federal registration and a state registration, the federal trademark is going to always win. However, you can't get a marijuana trademark registration for cannabis when it's a direct trademark for cannabis. So your state trademark is still going to be incredibly important. So this is an example of some of the thousands of cannabis companies out there do, that are doing exactly what I think all of you are hoping to do, um, sell products or services in the licenses for cannabis in the state of Michigan. Not all of these companies are in Michigan. I think probably this is the only one I'm aware of. This company here is working on it. I know this company here is working on it. These are just some examples of obvious marijuana trademarks here. Um, we do something that most IP attorneys call circling the wagons, all right? When you are a cannabis business, your most important product and the most important service is obviously either growing marijuana, processing marijuana, selling marijuana to consumers, transporting marijuana, testing marijuana. But any company, and yours included, are going to do other types of activities. If you are a provisioning center, you likely have products that aren't just purely cannabis products there or you might promote your brand the same way other companies promote your brand. You might have apparel products, stickers, posters, uh, you might have smokers articles, ashtrays, lighters, rolling papers, etc. All of those products are federally legal. What isn't federally legal? The cannabis flower, the cannabis edibles, the cannabis vapes, etc. Right? So what we do is we look to the products or services we can sell and see which of those products and services are legal. Right? We look to more than what the cannabis allows us to do. We see what our brand can be. And, and a great set of inspiration for that is other companies. You know, obviously big, huge companies are going to have hundreds and thousands of products and services that they provide that aren't their day to day. The Coca-Cola company sells soft drinks. That's what they do. But they also have stickers, posters, charities, blogs, um, coolers, koozies, etc. right? Let's assume, for sake of argument, Soft drinks are federally illegal the same way cannabis is, right? What would the Coca-Cola company do? They would identify everything else they sell and get federal trademark registration protection for those products and services because if soft drinks are federally illegal the same way cannabis is, they're federally illegal for Pepsi, for RC, for Sprite, for all these other soft drink companies, right? So when we have an equal playing field, it's not like only the Coca-Cola company can't register that mark. Every company in that service and industry can't register that mark. So we protect ourselves by circling wagons of protection around us, basically. If we want to do a koozie, right, or a cooler, um, because clients who are going to be purchasing soft drinks usually put them in something that keeps them cold, then that's obviously going to be something that's going to help our consumers identify us as a business, build our brand, and then thereby protect our brand. The other thing that's important, I kind of skimmed past this, but I wanted to get to an example, is let's imagine the Coca-Cola company didn't have a registration for a koozie. Does everyone know what that is? The little foam thing that goes around your can, obviously. So what a trademark lets you do, and this is very important for the cannabis company as well, is if the product or service is related in the minds of your consumers, you can still use your trademark registration to protect yourself. So if the Coca-Cola company did not have a federal registration for the koozie drink accessory, but they had protection for all these other things, coolers and soft drinks and stickers and apparel and everything. Um, they could argue that a company out there who was just selling koozies, something that the Coca-Cola company had not registered, uh, but wanted to use something that's confusingly similar to this mark here, Coca-Cola, uh, they could use the protections they did have to stop that, even though they have not specifically claimed koozies, because this product, the drink cooling device, known as a koozie, uh, is related in the minds of a consumer. Another great example, I like to use big brands so everyone, know, everyone knows what I'm talking about. Let's imagine we're McDonald's, right? We have, um, our primary business would be retail source services in the field of fast food restaurants, right? Everyone knows McDonald's, there are thousands of them in the state. Um, 
McDonald's is in the business of providing restaurants, namely fast food restaurants, right? So what happens if someone wants to make a McDonald's brand um, burger or, or, or ground beef and sell that in grocery stores, right? Obviously, raw, uncooked meat sitting in the fridge section of a grocery store is not a fast food restaurant. However, what does McDonald's sell? Primarily cheeseburgers, right? If I went into a restaurant, it would be reasonable for me to think that if I see a McDonald's ground beef product sitting in the cooler, it is going to be coming from a company that is also called McDonald's, famous for its hamburgers. If I walk into the coffee section of a grocery store and I buy a bag of coffee beans and it has Starbucks written on it, it's, and I'm a consumer, I am going to naturally assume that's a product from the famous coffee company Starbucks, right? And if you are not the company trying to use that mark, those products are related in the minds of a consumer. Those companies can use their other protections to stop you from doing that. Now, if I'm McDonald's, the auto repair company, right, I fix cars, there's nothing inherently connected between fixing cars and fast food restaurants, right? So it, that's how trademarks aren't per perfect. You can't register a mark for one product and say it stops everything else. You need to prove the products or services are related, and the more tenuous that relationship is, the less likely it is you're gonna be able to win that dispute because trademark enforcement is a business suing another business at the end of the day. So if you walk into the courtroom and you're going after the ground beef company called themselves McDonald's and you represent the McDonald's fast food restaurant, you have a better argument than if you're trying to stop some uh, automotive repair store that's also calling McDonald's because you don't really have a good argument to say, my fast food restaurant is, you're confusing my fast food restaurant consumers by selling them, you know, auto repair services, right? So you can probably naturally think about what we're going to be doing here for cannabis. We identify things we can sell that are legal. You know, I like to use smokers articles, it's very obvious. I sell cannabis, I'm a dispensary, okay? What else do my consumers naturally want to use? Lighters, ashtrays, water pipes, um, you know, if I'm a more health focused, I might have non-infused products such as creams, lotions, you know, other health items, maybe non-infused teas and things, right? What is your brand? You know, there are a lot of ways to run cannabis companies. If you are identifying yourself as a certain type of concept and you're providing services and products that are in line with that concept, then you're going to give yourself arguments to stop other people from using similar ideas, right? Um, and what a lot of companies do is they're adaptable. They can do a lot of things. So uh, here's a famous Cal um, Colorado-based basically topical provider, they have a federal registry, oh, they don't, I'm sorry, this is my non-example. They do apparel products, right? This company specializes in um, infused topicals, lotions, creams, etc. Well, that's federally illegal. So they are currently, I wanted to start with them, they only have common law rights. So they haven't registered anything, that can still be better than nothing. They can prove with a website that they have products for sale, namely apparel products, right? Now, that's not as good as if somebody out there wanted to call Mary Jane's Medicinals, um, you know, and it'd be a t-shirt store, uh, you know, if they register that, then it's going to be difficult for Mary Jane's to keep selling apparel, but Mary Jane's isn't in the business of selling apparel, they're in the business of selling topical products. So what they're doing is the same way that you might have a Yeti hat on or a, um, you know, a McDonald's, you know, graphic tee or something, you know, they have other products that help promote their brand. If you are a, a big fan of Mary Jane's Medicinals, you might rock the hat, right? Other companies take a more practical approach. Uh, this is MenMen, Men, one of the bigger dispensaries in the United States. Uh, they have a federal trademark registration for online blogs, basically, in the field of cannabis. What does this company do? They try to get cannabis consumers into their store. So what is a service they're providing? They provide blogs, articles, news stories about cannabis products and cannabis culture because where am I gonna go to learn about cannabis? Probably the place I go buy cannabis. So. You know, if they promote themselves in this way, um, they're going to have a website. I want to figure out where I'm going to get my next, you know, set of products from. I like products I'm getting from these guys. I might also like to learn more about what these products do. So I'm going to go to their website, read about what the different strains and products are. I'm going to stumble across other services they have, such as, you know, topical, interesting entertainment stories, or alternatively, um, medical entertainment. So the what Ohm of Medicine does in Michigan is they do something similar to MedMen, except for in Michigan at the time they registered this mark, we only had medical marijuana. We did not have adult use marijuana, what MedMen is taking advantage of in their states. So OM did something slightly different. They did educational services, namely in the field of medical marijuana, right? 
Uh, similar idea, you're using a blog to promote a trademark registration, get that trademark registered with the United States Patent and Trademark Office to stop other people from opening dispensaries and using med, names like MedMen and Ohm. Uh, but given the tools available to these companies and the markets that they're in, it kind of distinguishes them a bit from which direction they go. I don't have a bet good picture on this, but I wanted to give an example of um, how other cannabis dispensaries are using other products, namely smokers articles. So uh, the king of cannabis has a couple, they're not a very big company that I'm aware of. They might be, no insult if, if you're related to them. Um, but they have a basically branded rolling papers. I know some of our colleagues, uh, I've gone to uh, trade shows, uh, and you can buy, even from law firms, you can buy ashtrays, lighters, you know, rolling papers. Instead of a business card, you'll get handed a box of rolling papers with, you know, somebody's law firm or, or service company on it. And that's how these companies are basically using products and services to promote their brand. Something any company is going to do, but something our industry can use trademark registration to protect something that we're not allowed to protect, namely our main cannabis service. So, um, state trademarks don't have as much fun information available. They are a bit more um, reserved. A state trademark registration uh, is just something listed. Unlike a federal trademark registration, which gives you a lot of legal presumptions, a state trademark registration is more of just a, a line in the sand. Um, there's not a lot of marijuana marks currently available to search because the database that's searchable only goes through 2017. There's likely to be several more cannabis companies in the next several years, namely after 2017, given where we are in our state right now. Um, but this is an obvious you know, cannabis trademark registration at the state level. Um, I took this uh, person's address off because I don't know who they are. But if you do do a state trademark registration, most companies are going to do that as their business and not as an individual. So you know, it, would be, it needs to list an address for your company your cannabis business is already going to be in a public database with its address, so it shouldn't be too concerning for you. But this is the type of information available when you register to mark. What it namely doesn't do is it doesn't tell you what the product or service is, right? So, you know, a federal trademark registration is going to be a lot more robust and have a lot more information available to you. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be looking to uh, company names, trademarks and uh, service marks filed with the state of Michigan when you're wanting to start a Michigan business because you should be available primarily who your competitors are going to be and what they're calling themselves. So there are three important elements that I probably glossed over, but I want to reiterate here. A trademark is a product or service, a mark, and using it in connection to that product or service. You do not have a trademark until you use that mark, right? And when I say use, I mean put that mark into commerce, right? If you want to take our mark, for example, uh, at the top of these pages, you see Cannabis Legal Group. We have our lo logo, our company name. Um, we provide legal services. We have a federal trademark registration for that mark where we have filed. We use this mark in connection to the provision of legal services. When we file that application, we need to prove that we're actually doing that. So we have our legal website, we have our business cards, we have our promotional materials. You would be doing the same thing with your marks and services. When you're ready to register one of these marks, you need to provide what's called evidence or specimen of that mark. So if you're a cannabis company and you're selling apparel, you can't just file and say you're doing it. You need to show that you actually have t-shirts available for sale. You can do that on a point of sale like we did with Mary Jane. Right? Clearly shop our store, here's the products available. You can also do that by showing like actual physical pictures of uh, products if they're in a brick and mortar like physical location. All right, so we can't directly federal fed registration, uh, we can't directly file federal trademark registrations, we can directly file state trademark registrations, but remember we're operating in Michigan. I'm sure a lot of you are sensitive to the fact that there are certain multi-state operators operating in several states. What these companies are doing is they are taking each state that they enter into, establishing state trademark registrations, and they are also identifying products or services they're selling that are federally legal to kind of blanket over the various states they're operating in. So one other important factor about state trademark registration, they are not vetted. When you file that state trademark registration, you just file the application. However, under the law, you need to be in use. So in theory, you could file a registration right now for your cannabis business, even if you're not currently open and operating. The state of Michigan isn't going to check because the state of Michigan just puts that in a database. It's evidence. So if you do that, you, you know, it's not technically illegal, but if you file a state trademark registration and you weren't in use and you're in a dispute and the other party can prove that that occurred, you've actually done more harm than good. Because if you had a dispute with me, you filed something with the state, 
and I can prove that you weren't actually using that mark for several months later, well, guess what? You know, you basically hurt yourself more than helped yourself. So just keep in mind, the state of Michigan is not going to make sure that you're filing this correctly. So if you're not legally in the market, right, if you're a state licensed you know, MMFLA business or a state licensed MRTMA business, and, you know, until you're actually selling these products and services, hold off on your state trademark registration, right? Because if you right now file for your marijuana retailer in the uh, MRTMA, you know, point of sale retail license type, you don't have that. If you file for your micro business license, state trademark registration, you don't have that. It's gonna be very easy for me to prove if you're sitting there in the database on September 25th, 2019, and that's when you filed your state trademark registration. Well, guess what? Applications weren't even available, and, <laughs> and you weren't even allowed to file until November 1st. So if I had a trademark dispute with you, and I could show that piece of evidence, I'm a happy camper in that litigation. All right, so as I already kind of told you, the secret is develop as much state trademark protection for your direct product or service, and then try to identify as many products or services that is reasonable given your IP protection budget that are related in the minds of your consumers. So if I'm a dispensary, I'm likely going to probably want to be interested in looking into apparel, stickers, smokers articles. Doesn't mean you need to do all those things. State trademark registration, I'll, I'll go through some costs in a moment, is a fairly affordable legal service, but you're not Nike, you're not Coca-Cola, you don't need to file 100,000 different trademark applications for each product or service you're potentially going to be selling. Identify the ones that are most important to your company and the ones that are most obviously related to what your, company, what your company's consumers actually purchase. All right, so register what you can, and what I mean by that is within your budget. You don't have to claim everything, and be prepared to file new products when you can. Cannabis laws are constantly changing. Obviously, uh, until very recently, we didn't have uh, recreational marijuana available. If you wanted to establish in the state of Michigan trademark protection, you could have established it for medical marijuana products and services, but not adult use marijuana products and services. If you're in the business of adult use marijuana products and services, well, now you're able to register something, right, where you weren't before. Um, I'm going to give you a pretty useful example about that in a second, but Obviously, trademark registration is restricted for cannabis companies. Um, so why would you bother registering right now? You don't have to. Trademark registration is not a requirement. It is a business decision. It is like purchasing an insurance policy to protect the brand you're trying to build. So why should I do that if it's so kind of hamstrung right now based on federal law? Um, some protection is better than none, right? It legitimizes your company. It gives your company visibility. When you are doing a, an IP licensing agreement with another company, um, if you only have common law trademarks, you have to figure out what you're licensing, right? Okay, um, I have this brand that I've built up, but I've been using it since 2008, and I think I've been using it in these markets, and I've never filed or registered anything. Well, guess what? Uh, if I'm writing an IP licensing agreement, I filed a federal trademark registration in 2008, here's my registration number. Done. It's all there. It's, it's citable, it's objective, uh, it's also visible. It is in a database that any company in the United States of America can go and verify if they have your registration number. It also gives you tools to enforce that mark. Legal presumptions. It also gives you the right to enter into the court system much more easily. Uh, it helps you conceptualize your IP, etc. So, why now? Because registration is going to put the burden of proof on someone else. If you are wrong, but you hold the registration, you probably can still win because it's going to potentially be too expensive for the party that's right to prove that you were wrong because they have to pay for all the costs. They have to come up with all the evidence. They have to put the time in to show and prove that they should be the ones to be able to control that IP idea. All right, so I want to use hemp and CBD as a perfect example of what trademark registration can do because in the 2018 Farm Bill, federal government legalized CBD and industrial hemp, which means CBD and industrial hemp was just as illegal as direct THC-based cannabis products until the end of last year. All right, the 2018 Farm Bill went into effect December 20th, 2018. At that date, industrial hemp and CBD products became federally illegal. What that means to me in the context of IP is they became registrable as federal trademarks. So what the USPTO did, and again, the USPTO is the agency that actually issues the registration, is they put out a guidance explaining how this is going to work. Basically, any CBD or industrial hemp or related 
um, trademark application that was pending that was filed before uh, December 20th is going to be considered ineligible because it wasn't federally illegal and any, ap any application that was filed after is going to be considered federally illegal. Um, so if you had something filed before that date, then you could take, if you were paying attention, you can update it so that you say, we intend to use this mark and it's going to be in use after December 20th when it would be legal to do so. Um, and you could maintain that application. Um, and then any future applications filed now for those types of products and services are legal. So what did we learn? If we look to the number of applications filed, not necessarily the number of successful applications that are using the product specifically CBD, hemp, or cannabis, or marijuana, in the descriptions of the goods or services that they are trying to protect themselves from, we see some pretty interesting information. If you measure these dates against how legal cannabis is getting, you'll see that cannabis is growing when it comes to people filing for protections. And these aren't necessarily direct cannabis products. These are people who cite the words cannabis, hemp, CBD, marijuana in the descriptions of the products or services they're selling. And clearly, uh, I know that these dates are a little kind of sporadic. I wanted to pick some key moments uh, to show how it's doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling. Um, but we have already doubled last year's filings and we're not even to the end of the year. That's 100% because at the end of 2018, we legalized industrial hemp and CBD. So at some point, I think we can all agree, um, at one, we are moving towards federal legalization of cannabis. And if you are not prepared to take advantage of federal trademark registration and you are a cannabis company, what did I tell you first? Whoever holds the registration can win even if they shouldn't because it puts the cost, effort, time, and money on the person trying to come after the person holding the registration. So if you know you want to be in the cannabis space and you don't have a trademark registration and someone gets it before you, uh, it's not unlike people who sit on um, domain names, right? You have the brand that should be cannabislegalgroup.com, but someone already registered it. And so what are you going to do? You want it, but someone else has it. And you're going to find yourselves in these situations where this IP protection that could have been available to you uh, might be problematic for you to obtain. So I ran through quite a bit of trademark information very quickly because I wanted to get to questions. I would prefer to answer IP questions. So if anyone has them, please let me know. Otherwise, I can keep talking at you. Yes, sir. So, so the question is, how many filings do you need to have? And technically speaking, I, I did kind of march past this. The, the R symbol, which I have on one slide, is only used for marks that are federally registered. So I believe Ben Ben, Oma Medicine has it. It's just very small. But I'm sure you're all familiar. It's the R with a circle around it. When you are using that symbol, what you are telling to someone observing that symbol is the mark you are using is a federally registered trademark. So. Uh, I like to use this example when I'm talking to my trademark clients. Um, each mark is unique. So if I am a logo, right, of a person standing here like this, and I want to use a similar logo for my company where my arms are like this, those are two different images. Those are technically two different trademarks, right? So which one do you want to register? The one that you use most often, the one that is most important to you. If you look at our logo, for example, we move the positioning of the green marijuana leaf all the time. We didn't file eight different versions of all the positions we use. We filed the one that is used most commonly because that is our federally registered trademark. It creates an umbrella, though, for any other trademark that is related in the minds of, the, of our consumers, right? If it is likely to confuse someone, uh, then someone else cannot also claim that protection. So if we are Cannabis Legal Group with the logo to the left, someone else can't go out there and try to register Cannabis Legal Group with the logo to the right because even though they're technically different marks, uh, they're clearly related, right? The same products and services, I, I assume. Uh, the image is practically the same. So if we go through our likelihood of confusion factors, they look the same, they sound the same, they create the same commercial impression. The products and services are related in the minds of a consumer. If we had one registration, we'd be able to protect ourselves from all the others. Um, and we basically, what we would do and what you could do in this situation is um, you have your one trademark registration and the rest would be common law trademarks technically because you're using them right, in connection to your products or services. So that is a trademark, but you didn't need to necessarily register them because you've registered something that already effectively protects you, right? Now, if you're a Nike or a Coca-Cola or a huge company like Apple, you probably have 
every variation of every word slogan and logo registered. They do that for a variety of reasons. They don't technically need to. It, it, it mostly is just building up a shield. Um, the average, I'll just give you some numbers because I thought I had a slide for it. Um, when you file a trademark, there are 45 different types of products or services that whatever you're selling is going to fall into. Some of these are buckets uh, that have you know, more products in them than others. Um, but apparel is a big one. Any apparel product you can think of is in class 25. So if I only sell hats and you only sell t-shirts, uh, we're both in the category class 25. We can potentially coexist in some of these categories. If, if I only sell hats and I specifically only sell hats and I make it very clear that I only sell hats and my trademark is similar to another apparel company that specifically does not sell hats, we potentially could both have registered trademarks if there's enough distinguishing factors between those two. Um, another good example of variations and things would be your company name, right? A lot of people's first brand concept, conceptual idea is just what the name of their company is. Filing your company, you know, filing your articles of organization doesn't create necessarily trademark protection, but it does create other types of protection, right? There are only so many companies registered in the state of Michigan that can have that name. If you tried to register another company and, and file some articles uh, with a same or similar name, they might not actually go through because the names are too similar. That's kind of similar to what a trademark's doing, but it's not because that's literally just the name of a company. Uh, I can be 123 Holding Company, you can be 123 Holding Company, you can be in the real estate game, I could be in the tennis shoe game, right? The name of your company has nothing to do with the products or services you're selling. That's what a trademark is. It's a mark sound, word, image, slogan, whatever, connected to a product or service, and that connection, you use it to sell that product or service. Technically, sell might not be the best word. You don't have to sell anything. But you're using that mark in commerce. So if I have 16 different versions of my trademark logo or slogan, but they're basically all the same, I would highly recommend that to start, you register the one that's most important to you. If you have two very different logos, um, and they're both used a lot, then you have to ask yourself, at what point is my use of this logo or connected to whatever products or service I'm using uh, high enough to the point where it's worth going through the process to protect it? Um, I know I'm focusing a lot on this question, but it's a good one. So let's imagine I'm uh, McDonald's again. So I would probably start with protecting the name of my business, McDonald's, maybe my golden arches, right? Um, maybe some, start looking at my slogans, have it your way, you know, et cetera. Um, but at some point, you know, I'm famous for some of the products I sell too. I could get a trademark registration for the word Big Mac or McNugget, right? And as my company grows and as I start putting value into these concepts, um, I, it's going to become more and more worth it to my business to create those protections, right? Um, if you want to think about McDonald's as a dispensary, if you start getting famous for a strain of cannabis that is exclusively something you sell, uh, then you might want to consider tr putting some sort of brand protection around it. You know, if you don't want to see the Big Mac being sold at a Wendy's, you know, you know, and you don't want to rely on your common law rights to prove to that other competitor that you were using it first and go into the courtroom as equals, then finally a trademark registration is going to give you a lot of tools to stop a competitor from doing something like that. It can be pretty much any mark you can think of. Um, a famous mark would be the chimes for NBC. Dun, dun, dun. That's a sound. It's nothing but a sound. They've registered that as a trademark. It's a, it's a source of some sort of conceptual uh, identifier that they use so that their consumers, when they hear that sound, know that they are a television broadcasting company. Uh, another one would be an insulation company. I, I Forgive me for not remembering the name. It's, I think, um, Panther or something, the Pink Panther. What is it? Owens Corning. Owens Corning, exactly. They have a, a specific color pink that they put into their insulation. And that color, just conceptually a color, is registered as a trademark in connection to the insulation that they're installing. The most common ones are going to be words or you know, phrases or images, that would be your logo, or the combination of words and phrases. But it can be sounds, it can be the shape of packaging. Now it's not necessarily packaging shape necessarily, but if you were, let's say, a, a shampoo company and, and every bottle you make is in the shape of a fish, then um, that specific shape can conceptually be a trademark sometimes because when I'm just walking through the uh, shampoo aisle of my grocery store and I see a fish-shaped bottle and I'm not reading anything, that bottle shape helps me identify that company that's selling that product, right? So some of those uh, weird areas you get into with trademarks aren't as universally applicable, but you, know, you can be as creative as you want. Yes, sir.
Great. So, so at the top, I told you there's lots of different IP out there. I, I wanted to focus on trademarks because I wanted to help companies build the idea of what they're selling to consumers specifically. Um, to protect the genetics of that strain would be a patent. A patent is what protects you as an invention, right? So if you've created something new, um, and, and invention is really the best word for it, something that did not exist before, then you can get protection for that new idea. That, that is traditionally what a patent would be. The other very famous IP protection that I kind of glossed over would be a copyright. That protects your authorship. So if I have been the author of a song, if I am the artist that created an image, I can establish copyright protection for that image. But copyrights are just authorship. It's not the connection of that idea to a product or service that you sell, right? Um, a patent is literally the new thing, right? It's not, you, you can, as the patent holder, allow 10 different companies to, to, to use that idea and get compensated for that. And each of those companies can, can create brands to help sell that idea. And that's what the trademark's gonna help you do, right? Imagine I came up with, the, the recipe for cola, right? And I then, as the patent holder, allowed Pepsi and RC and Coke to go out there and sell it, right? Maybe some variations of it, et cetera, but, but they can each distinguish themselves from other sources of that product through trademark protection. Um, if I want to have a company logo designed for my company and I go hire an artist to paint this picture of a bear or something, um, that artist is the author of that work of art. Uh, that is a copyright protection. Their ability to sell that, so somebody doesn't just plagiarize it from them, is a copyright protection. But once a company owns that art, uh, and they want to slap it on the side of a, a rolling paper box, now they're using it as a trademark, right? So these concepts overlap. Um, but because our focus here it was on helping a business out there, um, every business sells something. That's what a business does. And how you sell whatever it is you want to sell, I assume it's cannabis related, it doesn't have to be, um, but the, the, the tools you use to help your consumers find your products and services uh, and, and the marks you're using um, are trademarks. And, and for most businesses, you don't need to really worry about copyrights. You, you might be buying one if you, or if you don't create it yourself. Um, if you're in the business of genetics and you're developing strains as a grower or something, then yeah, patent law is very interesting. Um, I'm specifically not a patent attorney, but basically you can patent anything under the sun. There's no real interesting avenues you take in patent law for cannabis, except for the fact that a lot more people are making it now. Um, but there's nothing really preventing you under the conceptual idea of patent law that would stop you from filing a patent that's cannabis specific, right? Uh, patents are federally, but, but here's the thing. A trademark specifically has to be a legal product or service, right? That concept of it being legal doesn't really apply to patents, right? I mean, you might not actually literally be able to develop it because it's illegal, but nothing about patent law says you can register it, right? So, so that's why, and, and maybe glossed over that, that's why I wanted to focus on trademarks, because if you're a cannabis business or you want to be a cannabis business, even if you do nothing more than choose a name for your company, you have a brand, you have a trademark, or you will have a trademark when you start operating. And these are tools you can use to start protecting yourself. If you, I mean, you use your brand to develop your reputation. If you think about the company Apple, love them or hate them, you think about those marks, you think about what does that mean to you. They have very specifically developed that idea in the minds of you, their potential consumer, right? Um, if you are um, a provisioning center and you have a great reputation and people think that you are the place they should go to purchase things because of your quality, because of your access to quality products, whatever it is, um, that's going to be the idea that someone wants to capitalize on if I want to take a provisioning center of my own and call it a similar name. I want to illegally, basically, or, or unjustly use the reputation you've invested in to, to help consumers know they should come to you when they hear these marks and, and instead redirect them into my store. When I do that, that is trademark infringement. If I want to sell a, a soft drink and I want to try to sell as much of that soft drink as I can and I call myself Coca-Cola with K's instead of C's, um, you're going to confuse people. People will be buying this product thinking they are getting a product that is held to the standard reputation of the famous Coca-Cola, whether you think that's a good reputation or not, that is what the infringement is. And that is why a company like Coca-Cola or a company like you might want to prevent someone from doing that. If there are a hundred cannabis consumers 
and you have 50 of them and they all know to come to you when they see your trademark, and someone else pops up using a similar mark and they get 10 of your consumers, you're down to 40. You have had a loss, you have been injured, and if they have done so in a way that is infringed upon your rights, that is what your trademark helps you prevent or in, ideally helps you correct. Now, the most important thing a trademark does is it is a notice to your potential competitors that this is a mark you're using. When I am helping a client come up with a new brand idea or they come to me saying this is what I want to call that brand, my first piece of advice to them is how'd you come up with that idea? Is someone else using it? In cannabis, we have a little bit of a leeway because there aren't federal trademark registrations available. And I'm sure you're well aware of the fact that there are similarly named cannabis companies in different states. Um, that happens for, in a lot of industries. In cannabis, if you're only California-based and you sell cannabis in California, there's not much you can do if someone uses a very similar name in Oregon or in Michigan until they come into this state, develop the products and services they are already doing in that state, the, that's how they protect their cannabis and they're pr actively prevented from doing that if they don't hold a license in this state. Um, they could very easily stop you from selling apparel, stickers, posters, smokers articles that if they have taken the steps to establish themselves as a provider of those products and services. Um, which might deter you from calling your provisioning center that, even if you could, because you don't get to promote your company the same way if you can't sell t-shirts and stickers and apparel if that's what everyone else is doing. If you can't have a website that has blogs and news articles and things about cannabis because someone else took the steps to protect themselves in the, in the web space uh, because they are providing a cannabis company in another state, you know, it's going to deter people from you know, building up a brand that's going to be eventually a direct competitor with you when federal law comes back down. So it's really a lot of positioning and it's really a lot of setting us, yourself up with a foundation. Obviously, when cannabis becomes federally legal, you should just file a federal trademark registration for the brands and marks you want to use. We can't do that, so we have to be creative. And that's why I'd rather talk about trademarks for an hour than just say, yeah, you can get a copyright. Nothing stops you, right? Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Right. So, so, so the question basically is, um, if you're not doing the cannabis portion of it yet, but you're doing other things that are legal, um, can you take that brand and eventually plug cannabis in? Is that, is that my understanding of your question? Okay. So, so yes, you, you, if you have an idea of what you want your cannabis company to be, nothing's stopping you from selling federally legal products and services and establishing trademarks for those products and services. In fact, that might actually be a very good idea because you can test the waters of how successful that brand might be while you take the time it takes to march through your local applications, your, your marijuana regulatory applications, while you're looking for your brick and mortar location for whatever kind of business you want to set up. And, and remember, uh, trademarks focus a lot on the actual direct consumer, but you're gonna have brands and services that are business to business as well. If you are a wholesaler of cannabis products, such as a grower or a processor, um, you, know, you potentially still have brand concepts that are very important to you, even if, even if you're a white labeler, even if you let the stores themselves brand their information on the products or services you sell, you're still providing the service of wholesale white label products. You know, it, instead, the way you would file a protection like that would be your consumers are other provisioning centers or your consumers are the processors. Um, and if another business out there can still infringe on what you're doing. If you're a safety compliance facility, your consumers are processors and growers that need to test their product. And how are you gonna distinguish yourself as, from you know, safety compliance facility number one from safety compliance facility number two? If one of these safety compliance facilities has a wonderful reputation of being quick, affordable, and having high quality testing results, um, you know, that's gonna have value in the marketplace. Or alternatively, if you're being lazy and you have a uh, cannabis testing facility that has a similar name to another cannabis testing facility and neither of you do anything about it, if one of those cannabis testing facilities gets shut down because they had poor quality and your name is confusingly similar to it, you might take a hit even though you didn't do anything wrong because people are going to hear that name and be like, oh, weren't those the guys that got shut down? I'm going to go to the other guy. So it doesn't have to be a battle. It can also just be awareness of how you're marketing yourself and how you're distinguishing yourself from competitors. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. 
Oh, it's not a deadline at all. So um, that is the date the 2018 Farm Bill went into effect. Um, and the 2018 Farm Bill is what legalized industrial hemp at the federal level. Um, so that would be, you know, industrial hemp, stock seeds, et cetera, but more, probably most obviously to, to most people in this industry, CBD products. So CBD is, is currently not federally illegal. Uh, there's not really a mechanism to be a manufacturer or seller of that yet. Uh, that's going to be getting designed. But the product itself, conceptually, is not illegal. So if you are able to sell CBD because you're doing so, you know, manufacturing in your state, if there's an ag pilot program like we have in our state, or if you're in a state that has a medical or adult use marijuana program, but you are able to, under the context of that program, create CBD-specific products, uh, assuming your state allows you to, that product itself is no longer federally illegal. So you could, in theory, have a federal trademark registration directly for that product. Uh, and the date I wanted to highlight for that was December 20th, because that's the date it went into effect. And when it went into effect, you can see that trademarks you know, grew quite a bit. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of trademark registrations every year. Uh, it's usually floating around 100,000. So obviously, less than 5,000 marks in the USPTO is, is minuscule. Right? The cannabis industry does not really take advantage of federal trademark registration, um, mostly because it's difficult to do so. And if you're focusing on getting uh, your grow set up, your, your testing lab set up, your dispensary set up, whatever it happens to be, you shouldn't distract yourself too much by trying to be an apparel company for your trademark. Right? You, it's a business decision of when and how you implement this. And, and even though I would recommend you do so as soon as possible, it doesn't mean you need to do so yesterday, right? If you are going to circle the wagons around your grow facility brand idea and you never get to the grow open, then why did you become an apparel company to promote your brand in the first place, right? So don't lose sight of the goal. It's to be a cannabis company and sell federally illegal <laughs> products and services in the state of Michigan. Um, but when you have a brand that you're doing that under, uh, and you're ready to build that brand up in the minds of the people you're interacting with, uh, then these are some of the tools we use to do that in this space right now. Yes, sir. Oh, did I skip that again? Yeah, so, so uh, the, to file a registration with the state of Michigan, I believe is $50. It used to be. They might have jumped it up to $100. Uh, the application itself is two pages, and it's basically demographic information, because, again, they don't verify that you're actually doing it. Uh, you, you get registered, and then you know, if you have to use it and the other party can show you weren't using it correctly, then it becomes problematic. But it's very affordable at state level. So once you have a product or service you're trying to promote that you're using in Michigan, it's either a $50 or $100 cost. It used to be $50 for, forever. Uh, federal trademark registration uh, is per class of product. So if you're doing smokers articles, um, non-infused topicals, and apparel, uh, that would fall into class 5, class 25, and uh, class 18, I want to say. So, you know, that would be three different classes. Um, when you file that mark, uh, it's $225 per classification. Uh, so if you're only filing for apparel, it would be $225. If you're doing apparel and non-infused topicals, then it would be, you know, $450, right? Because it's per class. Uh, if you do what's called an intent to use application, uh, that means you hope to use that mark, but you actually aren't using it yet. Um, there's an additional cost that will be associated. So you get to file that mark, you go through the entire evaluation process just like every other filing, uh, but at the end, instead of getting registered, you get what's called a notice of allowance, and that is a period of time anywhere from six months to three and a half years where you prove to the USPTO that you actually are using it in commerce by putting proof on the record. And when you put that proof on the record, there's an additional $100 fee for each class. So if you do an intent to use, it's really $325. $225 up front, $100 at the end, if at the date you filed your mark, you're already in use, then it's just 225 per class. Um, now, the actual work involved in those applications varies very, quite significantly depending on the scope of the product. If there's other confusingly similar marks out there that you're trying to strategically navigate around, um, or if you know that you're going to file a mark intentionally because you want to enter into a dispute with another party, there can be a, a huge variation of legal work. I would say the average trademark application that, that needs to be evaluated, submitted, and then monitored throughout the process is going to be roughly a five to six hour project. Um, it can be significantly less if you're lucky. Uh, if you enter into a dispute or if the Patent and Trademark Office you know, has issue with the way you're filing that mark, you know, it can be another five to ten hours of work sometimes. So depending on the attorney you're working with and, and what they're billing you at. In the grand scope of legal work, it's a very affordable project. You do. So, so the application itself is about a, a 9 to 12 month process, depending on your mark. Um, once you are registered, 
uh, it technically lasts for five years. And then you renew it, and it lasts for another five years, and then every renewal after that is a 10-year window. So if you fail to renew your mark, it doesn't mean you're not using it anymore, just the federal registration that you've created falls away. Cool. Anyone else? Am I good? Do I have time? All right. I guess I'm done. So thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'm going to focus on...